Greetings and welcome to worship on this third Sunday of Advent. This is the Sunday that we light that pink candle on the Advent wreath, that candle of joy. But where is it that we can find joy exactly in a strange season like this? Well, we'll reflect on that in our worship this morning. But first, just a welcome to all who are joining us from wherever you're joining us from. It's great to have you with us, and we hope your time with us is a blessing on your day. If you're so inclined, we just encourage you to check out our church community a little more by visiting our website at gslcc.ca. And there's no further announcements really today other than just to say keep your eyes open for emails coming uh, down the pike in the next couple of weeks. Uh, that will give you details on our upcoming services and other worship opportunities at other congregations you may wish to take advantage of, um, and also opportunities for online communion uh, as, as that evolves uh, over the weeks ahead. So let's take a moment to uh, prepare our hearts and minds for worship, and then we will continue. And let us worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose forgiveness is sure and whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Together, let us honestly and humbly confess that we have not lived as God desires. Loving and forgiving God, we confess that we are held captive by sin. In spite of our best efforts, we have gone astray. We have not returned the friendship you have shown us. We have not loved our neighbor. We have not tended the gift of this creation. Restore us, O God. Wake us up and turn us from our sin. Renew us each day in the light of Christ. Amen. People of God, hear this glad news. By God's grace, your sins are forgiven and you are free. Free from all that holds you back and free for a life of loving and blessing the world. May you be strengthened in God's love, comforted by Christ's peace and led by the guiding of the Holy Spirit. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We sing our gathering hymn number 242, Awake, Awake, and Greet the New Morn, which, just a heads up, if you're following along in the bulletin that was uh, sent along with the video, uh, is a change from the bulletin. The hymn we are singing, though, is 242. Let us sing.
be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Stir up the wills of your faithful people, Lord God, and open our ears to the words of your prophets, those who spoke once through the words of Scripture, those who call us today to pay attention to the wrongdoing you hate, and those who point us to the light of your love and grace, that we may know the joy of caring for others and all creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And I invite the children to gather around the screen. Hi, guys. Good to see you. Here we are back at our nativity set, right? Uh, right beside our Christmas tree. And look at a beautiful Christmas tree we have this year, don't we? Anyway, we're back at our nativity set, and we're talking about waiting like we have for the last couple of weeks, how God wants us to wait for all those things we're waiting for in our life. And so we've talked about uh, loving and caring for others while we're waiting. That's one great way to wait. And last week, we talked about waiting with hope, right? Trusting that God is looking after us and caring for us even while we're waiting for whatever we're waiting for. And today, we're going to talk about another way to wait. And uh, I've got a new figure here in our nativity set, and I'm going to get our camera to um, zoom in. It's this guy right here. You know who that is? That's John the Baptist. Maybe, uh, maybe you don't know too much about John the Baptist, but he was a relative of Jesus. Some think he was his cousin. And John was really good at doing one thing, at pointing people to Jesus and telling people about Jesus especially people who were sad or having a hard time or worried or anxious because he knew that Jesus' friendship could cheer them up, could make them happy, could fill them with joy. And that's what we want to talk about today, joy, waiting with joy, because that's a wonderful way to wait. When we wait with joy in our heart, that can make our waiting a whole lot easier. And how can we have joy in our heart? Well, our Bible gives us a good suggestion today. Our Bible says, give thanks. If we can think of one thing every day to be thankful for, that's an awesome way to feel joyful. Because, you know, you can't be thankful and sad at the same time. It just doesn't work that way. So if we can think of one thing to be thankful for every day, that can fill us with joy and help us to wait. It doesn't matter what it is. Maybe it's your friendship with Jesus. That's a really big thing to be thankful for. Or maybe it's your mom or your dad or your grandma or your grandpa or your special friend at school or, or uh, something that happened to you that day. Or maybe a favorite food you got to eat or a favorite thing you got to do. Whatever it is, whenever we can be thankful for one thing, that can fill us with joy and that can really help us to wait well. So I'm going to get the camera to pull out again. And how about we pray about that? Let's fold our hands, bow our heads, and let's pray. Help us, God, to be thankful every day and to be filled with joy as we wait. Amen. Okay, well, we're going to walk over to our Advent wreath again, guys. Um, and this week we light three candles and... One of the candles is that special candle over there, the pink candle, right? Because that's the candle of joy, which is what we were talking about today. So let's light all three candles, including our candle of joy, and sing our song.
Though the people had returned to Jerusalem from exile in Babylon, they continued to face hardship and oppression. In the language of the Jubilee year described in Leviticus 25, the prophet, moved by the Spirit of God, announces deliverance for those who are oppressed and comfort for those who mourn. Our first reading is from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. For my whole being shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm 126, and we begin with the refrain. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses in the Negeb. May those who sow in tears reach, reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Paul concludes his letter to the Thessalonians by encouraging them to live lives of continual joy, prayer, and thanksgiving. The closing blessing is grounded in the hope of Christ's coming. Our second reading is from 1 Thessalonians. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And then let us sing our gospel acclamation. Gospel according to John, the first chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Come now, O Prince of Peace, open our hearts and minds to your word. Fill us with your love, your hope, and your joy. Amen. One of the most celebrated works of art of the uh, German Renaissance is a work known as the Eisenheim Altarpiece. This is what it looks like. Maybe you've seen it before. It was created by the uh, artist Matthias Grunewald, who lived between 1470 and 1528, and who by the end of his career was an avid supporter of Luther and the Reformation. It's called an altarpiece because it was created to hang above the altar in the chapel of the Monastery of St. Anthony in Eisenheim, whose monks, interestingly enough, were well known for their care of plague sufferers, which explains why the body of Christ in this depiction is pitted or covered with plague-like sores, which you might only be able to see if you had a closer look. In many ways, it's a fairly conventional depiction of the crucifixion, at least that middle panel, with one glaring exception. And that's the arresting figure standing to the right of the cross, holding the scriptures, and rather dramatically pointing to the dying Jesus. That's John the Baptist, which may strike us as more than a little bit odd, given that John obviously wasn't alive at the time of the crucifixion. But what we need to remember is that these altarpieces were not just church decoration. They were proclamation. They were ways of teaching the Bible and theology with pictures to the masses who were largely illiterate. Which means that what Grunewald has given us here is not just an artistic masterpiece, but a sermon. A sermon, at least in part, on our gospel reading for today. 
and a sermon that proclaims one central and overriding truth, that it's all about Christ, and not about us or our deeds, our works, our accomplishments, or our striving. Nor, as Grunewald was saying in the spirit of the Reformation, neither is it about you, dear Pope, or your church, or your power, or your privilege. It's all about Christ and what Christ has done. What Christ has done and is still doing to free us from our sins, our concerns, and our preoccupations, and what Christ has done and is still doing to free us for a life of joyfully taking up our true calling. And that's a calling that's echoed in those soaring words of Isaiah this morning from our first reading. To bring good news to the oppressed, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, to comfort all who mourn. Or as Luther himself would say, to care for our neighbors and all their needs. As John so relentlessly deflects all attention away from himself in our gospel today, he points us away from ourselves as well and to the one in whom we truly live and move and have our being, the one who frees us for the joy of the life that truly is life. And frankly, that's a sermon I think we need to hear even more clearly these days, if you ask me. You know, as I began to hear those stories of churches, some even in our own province who were defying the public health orders, meeting in person, even protesting and demonstrating their right to gather, I could only hang my head. I tried, I tried to be sympathetic. I mean, we're all suffering from this isolation. We all miss gathering as we once did and worshiping as we long to. And maybe, maybe those churches don't have a synod like we do who has been able to support us so wonderfully through all these months. But ultimately, I couldn't bring myself to feel much for them because all I saw were churches pointing to themselves and putting their needs and their desires above every other consideration. Churches saying in so many words, it's all about us and our rights and our privileges. And churches that could have used some time meditating on Grunewald's altarpiece, a little bit of time contemplating his sermon. But lest we get too smug, we have to admit our own weaknesses too, don't we? Maybe we're not tempted to defy public health orders so much, but Christmas is coming, isn't it? And we know the yearnings that stirs up in us. In a normal year, we'd all be looking forward to that Christmas Eve service down the road, right? We'd be looking forward gleefully to the prospect of a full church, pews packed with worshipers, eager to be there, basking in the glow of candlelight and song. Yes, we know it's about the birth of Christ, but it's also about us feeling good about ourselves, isn't it? And our congregation and its ability to still, to still draw in those numbers, even if it is just one evening a year. We know it's about the birth of Christ, but it's, it's complicated, isn't it? Complicated by our desire to relive the days of the church as they once were, where every Sunday met us with the sanctuary as full as Christmas Eve is today, and complicated by our hopes, our dreams, our ambitions for the future. Except that Christmas is about the birth of Christ. It's all about the birth of Christ. Just as our whole lives are about the Christ who died to free us from our dreamy nostalgia and our longing for the past and free us for the life we are called to live in this moment, this day, this time. Yeah, even as God's people, 
we can forget what it's all about. Which is why we need preachers like Matthias Grunewald and witnesses like John the Baptist. Because in pointing us to Christ, they're not just callously or Grinch-like turning us from our heart's desires and our longings. They're directing us to a joy so much deeper, so much fuller than we could ever desire. And a joy that can satisfy our hearts and our souls beyond even what we imagine for ourselves. It's the joy of knowing we are loved eternally, unconditionally, and unreservedly by a God who gave his very life for us and who rose again that we might know life in abundance. A God who never forgets us or takes his eyes off of us for one second. A God who gives us a future, not just in this lifetime, but for eternity. A God who forgives us even before we think of asking. A God who hears every prayer we pray and promises to respond in wisdom and in grace. A God who never leaves our side. A God who knows our suffering, our pain, and our struggle, and who holds us in an eternal embrace of mercy. A God who comes to us over and over again through the words of Scripture and the touch of the sacraments, and a God who blesses us through the gifts of neighbors, friends, family, caregivers, and creation. The God who John points us to today the one who stands among us even now is a God who loves us beyond our imagining. And in that love, we can find a joy to loosen our grip on our self-concern and our ambition and grab a hold of that life lived for others. A life of using our hands to point the world's attention to those oppressed by the exploitation of others, those crying out near and far, for the justice God so loves and desires for all. And the life of using our hands to tend to the mourning and the brokenhearted among us. And to willingly make those sacrifices that this moment calls for. Even if that means not gathering for a while. Or letting go of our Christmas dreams for a year. In the love of God who gave his only son to die we can find a joy to forget ourselves and turn our hearts to a world in need. And more. We can find a joy to take up those practices Paul recommends in our second reading today. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God and Christ Jesus for you, he writes. How radical is that? In a time when so much around us, our media, our daily conversations is pointing us to what we've lost and what we're losing, how radical is it to still rejoice and still give thanks? And yet, in the joy of God's love, we can. With our attention turned away from what we lack and towards what we have in God, we can see reasons to rejoice every day in the hope-filled beauty of a West Coast sunset, in the blessing of a phone call or a video chat with a friend, old or new, in the opportunity to be a blessing to someone struggling with loneliness or depression. And we can find reasons to give thanks in all circumstances for the ways we're learning to live more justly and compassionately with the earth and with others for the opportunities we're being presented with to be more generous with our financial resources, for the chance to explore a deeper, more meaningful prayer life. In the love of a Lord who died on a cross, bearing even the scars of a pandemic, we can find a joy even to rejoice, even to give thanks, even now. And in that way, Maybe we can be like little John the Baptist, pointing others to a light in this time of darkness, pointing others to a hope in this time of despair, and pointing others to a love that can even make sacrifice 
a privilege. Maybe our lives, too, can become a sermon. A sermon to proclaim the good news of the God who frees us from ourselves and frees us for the joy of loving God, loving others, and loving all creation. So let it be. Amen. And we sing our hymn of the day, number 252, each winter as the year grows older. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Advent Creed. We believe in God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth, the one who is full of patience, who is not afraid of silence, who does not need to fill each moment with activity and noise, the one who is beyond bluster and flurry, and who does not jostle for attention. We believe in God the Son, Savior of creation, who slipped into Bethlehem one night, mostly unnoticed, who lived 30 years without headlines or hurry, who frequently took time alone with his patient father, who waited for the right time to become the suffering servant, who stood quietly before the noise of his accusers, whose silence overpowered their words, who died, then rose again on a quiet Sunday morning. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens, empowers, renews, and refreshes, sometimes arriving with obvious power, sometimes with the quiet breath of a whisper. We believe in one God, who patiently waits for us, and longs for us to do the same. 
yearning for God to tear open the heavens and come quickly to our weary world. Let us pray for the needs of all people and all things everywhere. Creation is waiting, O God, waiting for rest from human exploitation, waiting for relief from global warming, waiting for healing. And so we pray, protect all ecosystems, habitats, and wildlife at risk of harm. And keep us mindful, even in days like these, of our need to care and advocate for our planet. God, for whom we wait, Hear our prayer. Many are waiting, O oh God, waiting for confirmation of the news that a whole new species of whale may have been discovered off the coast of Mexico. And so we pray. Inspire us with news like this to delight in the mysterious beauty of our world and to inspire others to share in the wonder of creation. God, for whom we wait. Hear our prayer. The people of South Sudan are waiting, O oh God, waiting for relief from the famine that is growing in their country. And so we pray. Restore favorable growing conditions in those areas hit by flood and political violence and move the nations of the world to respond as proactively as possible to avoid yet another humanitarian crisis. God, for whom we wait, People around the world are waiting, O oh God, waiting for the distribution of the COVID vaccine. And so we pray, grant patience to people everywhere and wisdom to those in charge of vaccination programs that the plans taking shape now will proceed efficiently and flawlessly. God, for whom we wait, the church is waiting, O oh God, waiting for your spirit to guide their worship planning over the coming weeks. And so we pray. Change the hearts and minds of those of your family who are opposing public health protocols. Inspire worship leaders to offer services that are faithful and hopeful. And open us all to receive whatever this very different season offers us with joy. Bless all the congregations of our BC Synod and especially today Chetwin Shared Ministry in Chetwin and Christ Lutheran Church in Chilliwack and their pastor, Dean Anderson. God, for whom we wait. Hear our prayer. Those who are suffering are waiting, O oh God, waiting for relief, comfort, healing, hope. And so we pray. Hold in your compassion all who suffer in any way, from the pandemic, from personal tragedies and losses, from mental afflictions, from illness of any kind, especially Susan, Elaine, Alicia, Don, Jean, Carol, Lori, Alma's son Robert, Joy's stepson David, Vivian, Al, Bob, Betty's daughter Cheryl, who is recovering from a broken hip, Pastor Kathy Martin, whose father passed away a couple of weeks ago, Bishop Greg, whose brother passed away suddenly last weekend, and all those others we name before you now, silently or out loud. God, for whom we wait, hear our prayer. We are all waiting, O oh God, waiting for a new day when life will be, if not back to the way it was, at least free of our fear of COVID. And so we pray, draw us closer to you that in your love we may be freed from self-concern and opened to the joy of loving and blessing others. And hear us now as we give thanks for all those blessings we have received. God, for whom we wait. Hear our prayer. Draw near to us, O God, 
and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us share Christ's peace. And then let us pray. Generous God, you have created all that is, and you provide for us in every season. Bless all that we offer, that through these gifts the world will receive your blessing. In the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, we pray. Amen. And then let us pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now receive the blessing. The creator of the stars, bless your advent waiting. The long-expected Savior, fill you with love. The unexpected Spirit, guide your journey, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We sing our sending hymn, number 239, Hark the Glad Sound.
Go in peace. Prepare the way of the Lord. And speak to God.